been going at uh, what time is 602 i shall call this meeting to order um madam clerk will you call the roll please good evening everyone um i will go ahead and call roll to get attendance i'll begin with director Holt. present where's ali here wood here sheets here kelly here stone here White. Here. Clark, have you joined us? And President Saylor is turning it back over to you. <coughs> Thank you. And I am present. Um, let's do the pledge to the flag and have Director Wood lead us, please. Pledge leading. The United States of America. America. And the Republic for which it stands. One, One nation. God, under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. The Metro Cable Announcement. The open session meeting is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14, replayed on Monday, March 14th at 6 p.m. and Tuesday, March 15th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14 webcast at metro14live.seccounty.net. Now is the public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within the district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Are there any speakers? There are no speakers that I'm aware of. Do we have callers? Or... All right, we have about 20 attendees. Art will go ahead and unmute those and give everyone a chance to speak, if they so wish. Well, attendees, you have the ability to unmute yourselves if there is anything you'd like to present to the board at this time. That is a negative. Thank you. Um, now we'll move to the consent items. Are there any questions about the consent agenda? If not, I will. And entertain a motion in a second. Madam Chair, I'll move the consent. Second. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? All right, we have a motion by Director Wood, seconded by Jones. I'll begin with Director Gould. Aye. Or Zally. Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. White? Aye. Clark, have you joined us? And sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to action items. Number one is the County of Sacramento agreement for advanced funding of costs for imposing a capital fire facilities impact fee. Mr. Jeff Fry, Chief Development <laughs> Officer. Thank you, uh, Director Sailors, and, and good evening, directors. I'm here uh, to talk you through an agreement between uh, Metro Fire and the County of Sacramento to fund the uh, impact fee, the mitigation fee. If you recall, part of the, uh, the board strategic plan in 2020 was to update all of our fee programs. Um, we had spent some time um, going through all of our growth plans and creating the nexus fee, which is required to update the fee study. Um, I was in front of the board in May of last year asking to adopt and then allow the fire chief to start negotiations with the county uh, to actually impose this fee. As you recall, as a fire district, we are not allowed uh, to impose this fee directly and we have to work with our city and county partners to do so. Uh, so through discussions with the county, um, they have requested this fee to prepare the package and take it to the board. Um, and a couple of notes here, we are allowed to recover the costs associated with this agreement through the administration of the fee program. Um, 
administration costs, as I understand, can account for up to 3%. We're currently about 1.8. So this additional costs can be recovered uh, through the impact fee program. And uh, I had a, a, a chance to talk to uh, Director Jones this week about how does Rancho fit into this program. So uh, just to explain, um, the county does administer or collect fees on our behalf within the jurisdiction of the city of Rancho Cordova. So in essence, by approving and moving forward with this agreement with the county, uh, that will also include the city. Uh, so uh, staff recommendation is uh, to sign this agreement, allow us to move forward with the process. Um, I do expect if all goes well, this will be to the county board of soups uh, sometime in May or June uh, for consideration. And I'm happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions for many directors? Madam President, I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Fry for the uh, explication of our uh, cities within our district. Thank you, Director Jones. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? I see Director Grant Gould has his hand up. Go ahead, Director. Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jeff, can you just uh, confirm that the same process that will happen in Ranch Cordova will be duplicated in the city of Citrus Heights? I think this the, the conversations I've had with the city of Sites uh, may not require this additional step with a formal agreement to take um, to the to the council. I understand once we jump through the hoops with uh, the county, the city will take the lead and we'll be able to take it to the council at that time as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Director Rosali, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. I, I do, but uh, Director Gould asked my question. So uh, I just want to take a moment to uh, express my appreciation to Jeff for the work that's gone into this. It, it's an important initiative. Thank you, Director Rosali. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Seeing no more, um, I will take a motion and a second. I'd like to make a motion to adopt uh, the proposed resolution and authorize the fire chief or his designee to execute the County of Sacramento agreement for advanced funding of costs for imposing a capital fire facilities impact fee for Metro Fire. Thank you. And I'll second that motion. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Director Gould. Aye. Rosali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. I see that you've joined us, but you're still muted. Sorry. Aye. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. And Director Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Our next action item is the fiscal year 2021-22 mid-year budget, CFO Dave O'Toole. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and board members. We're waiting for the PowerPoint to come up. There we go. I'll get started. I'm Dave O'Toole, and um, I will be presenting the mid-year budget. Let's see. So, um, next slide already. There we go. Okay. So, the uh, first, I want to talk for a minute on how we developed the mid year budget adjustments. So, as it says on the screen there, uh, they're based on actuals through the end of December 2021. And then we project for the, the six months that follow. So um, we have some updated spending through January that we refined the budget a little bit, but um, it's basically actual through December and projections through the rest of the year. Um, as noted in the Finance Audit Committee, rece um, received a very similar report back on February 24th, and now we're bringing it to all of you for uh, consideration for final approval. The, uh, without any action to correct course, the operating fund condition would reach a projected state of negative 12.4 million by June 30 of this year. Uh, that shortfall is approximately 4% of the district's budget. Um, and uh, closing that gap requires reducing expenditures, as you might guess, and augmenting the general fund. And part of that augmentation is transferring available balances from other funds to the general fund. 
uh, if the changes proposed tonight are adopted, the district will have a reserve of 12.5% as of June, on June 30th of this year. There. Thanks. Okay, so how do we get here? There are three significant erosions. There's really a number of factors, but I wanna highlight three that are sort of large and, and consequential. So the first is the GEMT, the ground emergency medical transport uh, reimbursement was delayed. Uh, payments received from the state of California, we expected to get this spring, will be de have been deferred until this fall, we're told. Um, the uh, you know, during mid year, uh, during the process of the mid year budget, we look at our assumptions, our revenue assumptions, and contact the, uh, the consultant who had advised us on this, and we're informed of this change with the with the state, and that the, the payments would be deferred. So that was a loss of three million that we expected to get this year, and we'll now get next year. So it is a, a timing difference, um, but unfortunately affects our budget immediately. Let's see, constant staffing callbacks. So that's, as it says there, that's the overtime payments to suppression staff who are called in to cover staff who are out, out on sick leave for any reason. Um, that could be COVID related, could be quarantine, could be caring for a family member, whatever the reason. Um, that does require the callback in of another, another suppression staff member. And that's an unanticipated cost. And altogether this year, it's 8.6 million over what we budgeted, which is about a 50% increase over what we had budgeted. Um, so pretty, uh, very significant, and you can tell the most significant factor we have to talk about tonight. Um, and then third, services and supplies, as you might imagine, um, the, uh, the, the cost of fuel and such sources has gone up, up after already this year. We expect even an increase uh, further on in this year. Um, and the cost of the, uh, the additional AMR staff and, and, and extending and, and augmenting our AMR contract cost is at 1.6 million. Of course, that's more than offset by revenues, but the total services and supply overage for this fiscal year is 2.8 million. And as I'll note in a million, note in a minute, we uh, we did make some significant reductions to services and supplies that cut that down to 1.8 million. But as we were building this, we were looking at a 2.8 million dollar shortfall until we made reductions to reduce that. This is, uh, I know it's kind of a busy slide here, so just I'll just very briefly tell you what's on it. The, uh, on the, the uh, leftmost column are the revenues, expenditures, and transfers, those bolded lines there. Uh, the second column is the final budget numbers as, as you, the board, approved them in September this year. And then the third column is the media revised numbers. That's where you can see the $12.4 million shortfall I mentioned, sort of squarely in the middle there, tw uh, uh, $12,394,674. And uh, the last column is the variance, so the difference between the final and the um, and the, the budget. Uh, the bottom line is a general fund shortfall shown on this page is negative 2.1 million, um, which is the amount that we will be asking to transfer uh, from the general fund reserve to the general fund to keep the keep the balance. Okay, general fund revenue. Starting with the revenue side. Uh, as you can see here, we had uh, state and federal COVID grants received an anticipated increase the, uh, relative to the final budget by 1.7 million. Um, so we did well on the grant side. Um, we, on the negative, we, that, that GEMT I just mentioned, that's 3 million that get deferred to, to next fiscal year. Uh, the medic cost recoveries are up and we included about a 1 million, um, two, excuse me, 2.6 million for that. And uh, let's see, property taxes were adjusted to include more up-to-date figures. So that was about $200,000 uh, increase. Turning to the expenditure side and focused on labor. Uh, overall, we saw a 9.9 .9 million increase in labor budget, uh, bringing it up to 213.6 million. Um, as I mentioned, constant stuff and callback, so 8.6 million of that. Um, let's see, the uh, it also included um, uh, uh, let's see, additional, we had additional vacancy savings of positions that were, we did not fill. We saved about 900,000 on that. Uh, the sick leave buyback went the other way. It was about 400,000 higher than we, than we budgeted this year. Uh, and deployment revenue was a 800,000 reduction um, in, in, in that because we didn't, but we also had an offsetting savings of 650,000 because of the decreased labor expense. So those are kind of the big factors that were happening in the, in the labor costs. Um, part of the budget. Some other, and let's see, mentioning. So, excuse me, Dave. So the 
the deployment revenue was eight hundred thousand below what was projected. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And the costs were also below. Uh, finishing up on the expenditure side, so services and supplies, I mentioned was 2.8 million for a total of 34.6 million. Uh, we did offset that by a million with some, with some cuts that were made in the current year. And uh, in, the ambulance service contract I mentioned was 1.6 million. Uh, diesel and gas was up by 225,000. Uh, equipment for approximately 50 firefighter positions not included in the final budget was about 440,000. And um, let's see, we did, and that's where the offsetting reductions to service and supplies are noted there. We saved about a million there. And uh, some other uh, bits and pieces, taxes, license, and debt service and related expenditures increased by 118,000, bringing up for a total of 4.6 million. What are your, uh, your summary of what, uh, what's being proposed here tonight? Um, again, in summary, the recommended mid-year adjustments to close the projected $12.4 million gap Deficit include recognizing the higher property tax revenues, uh, increased intergovernmental revenues of 1.6 million, uh, largely EMS related, uh, transfer of IGT revenue and the balance there of 4.7 million, transfer of leased properties fund and capital facilities financing fund of 2.3 million, uh, transfer from the general fund reserves of 2.1 million and miscellaneous adjustments of 1.5 million. If adopted, the projected reserve balance on June 30, again, would, would be 31.7 million or 12.5% of the net budgeted expenditures. Uh, the recommendation staff is to approve the resolutions uh, in your packet tonight, adopting the mid-year budget and amendments for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2022. That concludes my presentation. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. O'Toole. I do have one question for you. At what point in time did you know about these um, fiscal shortages? The, um, uh, the I'll start with the GMT in particular. We um, we that was a, a revenue we anticipated receiving in the spring. So as we're developing the mid-year budget, which is really in, in early February, we start that process. Uh, we reached out to our consultant to verify this is still coming and learned that it was not coming, that it had been de delayed. And I double checked with my predecessor to see if he had any additional news on that. He sort of confirmed it for me as the DHCS. So uh, that was in early February. And then with the uh, with the constant staffing, you know, we could see it incrementally creep, creeping up through the, uh, you know, as we're looking at the bi-monthly fiscals. But, it, it, you know, for those who are on the Finance and Audit Committee, it wasn't, wasn't a terribly noticeable um, uh, uh, or, or pronounced a deviance, a deviation until later, until later this fiscal year. So um, really, we only really started to pick these things up, although there were hints um, in the bi-monthly, but really formally picked it up when we put together the projections to see what, what, the, what was going to happen with these trends for the rest of the year. Does anyone else have any questions? Just to mm -hmm. go ahead. Good, Jack. Uh, the 400,000 over on the sick leave buyback, that's just that was, once again, more people sold or sold more hours than had been anticipated based on historical averages. Exactly, that's and how we, we put it together looking at past years and for some years, for reasons you know, we haven't quite figured out, but it was a uh, big search this year. Well, do you think pepper reform could be you know a factor because there could seems be. to be less incentive to, uh, bank for service credit if you're, you know, your retirement age is um, gone much higher. Most yeah. people I think will reach those service years. So. Good point. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Director Walk, are you? I'm done. Further? Okay. Um, good evening, Mr. O'Toole. Good evening. I have a, a couple questions about the, uh, it's on page 60, the capital outlay summary. Um, there's, and it's probably just I need your help in, 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 in understanding this here, but um, uh, some of these things like under cap, capital facilities, as well as the federal grants, uh, there's not under principal interest costs, annual financing costs. Now, aren't, are, there are blanks on a lot of things. 
for that uh, the right hand side those columns mm -hmm. for whether or not they're financed and the principal and annual financing costs etc so i'm wondering are these things happening like for example there's uh this is just one, you know one little example here it says portable shower and bath trailer it says one but everything else is blank so what happened to that and, and the same situation with the federal grants uh, i'm not sure of the status do we or, because on the uh, the last several columns on the right hand side are blank for most of these federal grants so help me understand do we do we have those grants or not uh okay so the um to, the items that are this is um the title is capital outlay summary of the page for mm -hmm. doesn't have it the um the items where there's just uh numbers under the price and amount but nothing further under principal interest those are items that are previously um, authorized and those are the that's the amounts that we're going to pay this fiscal year the amounts where there's uh, where there's principal and interest and numbers shown to the right, that's what we're planning on purchasing uh, this fiscal year. So we typically will make those purchases in late this year, May or June. So um, we anticipate everything, This all of this was verified as part of the mid-year budget process. We anticipate that all of this will go forward okay. and it's built into the budget. All right, so, um, well, for example, what's the, is it an internal cost for the portable shower and bath trailer? It's under fleet maintenance. It's kind of in the middle of the fleet column. It's, it, there's nothing at all, and no price nor amount. So is that going to happen or not? So that, I believe that item got moved because originally the trailer was going to have wheels on it, so it was going to be a fleet item. Uh -huh. It has since been moved to a separate account, so it is still going to be purchased. It's just not under that specific line item anymore. Oh, OK. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, to better answer the question, a lot of these items um, that you see without the principal and interest are, are purchased out of the general fund where the items with uh, principal and interest would be items that we finance. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's why it has that, the, those separate uh, dollar amounts. I yeah. can understand that part, but I was just curious about how come some, well, anyway, you've answered my question. Thank you, gentlemen. Sure. Okay. Yes, I see that Director Gould has some comments or questions. Go ahead, Director Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really quickly, could you go back to this slide in the presentation, if possible, to look at the revenue piece of it? In a, because I think sometimes people hear costs like overtime cost, and, and that gins up some, some considerations. But I think when you look on the revenue side of the, of the sheet, if you look at some of the increased revenue that was resulted from that constant staffing, I mean, at the end of the day, if we don't put an ambulance to a call, we do we can't do cost recovery. And so, I think it's important that we we consider the balance there. We're spending more in overtime. We're also staffing units that then can uh, respond to requests for services, which in many cases have a cost recovery attached to them. So I think it's important that we look at both of those and it'd be interesting to kind of look at that side by side so that perhaps people's perception of this constant staffing over time uh, isn't as severe. And if I may add Director Gould's comment too, we, as I mentioned, uh, we did add significant number of staff this year, but you know, they're just starting the academy you know, late last month. Right. So they're not contributing uh, uh, to the, if you will, the solution to constant staffing. They won't be doing that until late this year or, or next year. We anticipate that having those staff available, we will not need to rely so heavily on overtime. Right. Staff. But as I look at the medic cost recovery piece of 2.6, right, that, that is a recovery that may not have occurred at that level had we not staffed some of the apparatus that we staff through constant staffing. So I think I think there just needs to be a recognition that it wasn't just we put $12 million into overtime and we didn't receive anything from that except people sitting around. There was a lot of work that was done to increase above projections, the meta cost recovery. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Gould. I have one more question. By moving, these funds around um does 
this delay any of the projects that we had planned on for this year? So these are un uncommitted balances. So no, this is everything that is in the budget as a planned expenditure is funded. So nothing is offended is affected this year. So there's no department that will have to cut their funds or won't be able to purchase anything and keep so business will go on as usual. Uh, we went through a process of reducing budgets as part of developing the mid year, um, but everything that was that was needed was retained and, and what we could reduce or really defer till next year. Uh, we, we did that. So the total savings, as I think I mentioned earlier, was about a million dollars what we were able to achieve this year. Okay. Okay, so go ahead, Director Jones. Thank you. Um, for example, when we get when we get the GEMT, yeah. will that go back to plug out the things that were to plug back in to so where things were deferred? It, it yeah, that is your discretion. Um, yeah, yeah, that yeah. that is an option. So we'll we'll build the budget with you to. I, unless things, unless we hear more bad news, I just but we'll build the budget that the money will be there, and it's a matter of how, how you want to spend it. Okay. What would be very uh, educational for me, and perhaps my fellow directors, would be uh, if we can see what was deferred now, and then we can use that to weigh, measure, balance how uh, in six months from now, when we get that revenue. If we want to plug that directly back in, or are there are other priorities, I think that would be very, very helpful for me. That's coming from reserves. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, well, it's coming from with the proposals for it to come from reserves now. So I guess the decision would be when we get it, that goes back to reserves. Or goes oh, well, good point. But I, yeah, that idea of, well, what, what else was reduced? Sure. Because there's probably 10 million, sounds like, was reduced somehow. And I just, well, oh, go ahead. No, That's no, not I was going to say. The we are uh, carrying out everything that was planned in the in the approved final budget, with the exception of that a million or so that we were able to find in in in, uh, in reductions to services and supplies that that either weren't needed or could be deferred. Well, I, I was thinking that there were two different budget reductions. One was when you were prepping the mid-year budget, and certain things were deferred, and then more recently, just now. Uh, because of what early February, the knowledge of the delay GMT, all that stuff. So that's like a second wave of deferment, so to speak. So if we can delineate that stuff and 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 let us know what those lines are that were deferred, it'd be. And if it is ends up being just the reserves, fine. I'm I'm all for plugging in reserves. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for that. As uh, I said earlier, the, those were uncommitted reserves, so there was nothing. Oh uh, yes, yes. To them as yet, eventually we'd want to use them. Of course, um, and Madam Chair, I, I just I'm I apologize, Mr. O'Toole. I just saw this. Um, I, I did meet with uh, 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 Mr. O'Toole and uh, uh, Chief Harms and Chief Bailey to help look at some of this stuff. And there is a discrep. I mean, perhaps it changed because it was a week later. On page again, staying on page wherever we are, 58. On page 58. Fund balance summary. Um, it has uh, on the Dropbox. It says other financing uses. The the middle section estimated funds available, expenditures, other finance. It says other financing uses. It's about five point two million, and yet in the in the document that uh, we used for our discussion, it had six point three under other financing uses. And uh, I mean, you can get back to me offline, but I'm just curious about that that difference. Uh, I think when when you when we had looked at it previously, that didn't. Um, I think that was the version that we used for uh, for the committee, uh, and then we had not yet incorporated it in the the MOU agreement that was approved tonight. So that was a so that's probably that was, a discrepancy. Yeah, we were and the yeah, change. Yeah, it was a change. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Director Gould, do you have a question or comment? Yes, Madam Chair, I apologize. I forgot one other thing. If we could go to the slide that shows the sick leave, and then also we had the, um, we had the sick time, what was it? 
where, where, where we paid out for for folks that were sick, not the actual leave, but somewhere in there you had a, a an amount of money that was for people that were sick and off duty. Um, the question I have for the organization is, hasn't there been, you know, literally millions, if not billions of dollars that have been provided to organizations who have been negatively impacted by the COVID? And I would think to first responder organizations who should go to the top of the list. To me, it seems like have, have we, I know we received a little bit of COVID funding, but it, was there money that was or is still available for us, given that that sick leave amount? Is there a way that we can ask for reimbursement through HERF2 or other federal programs that could be provided to our organization, given the fact that an, a percentage of that, that sick leave was a result of first responders being exposed to COVID or their family members? And the federal government was trying its best to help organizations remain whole or have a zero impact. Have we have we not done that? Um, can somebody help me understand why that that number is not smaller because it's been offset by federal or state funds? Go ahead. So we we did build in um, grant revenues of. I, um, I, I'm going to say it's 1.7 and it's right around there. Right. Uh, and um, which includes about 900,000 we've already, uh, we've, we've already obtained um, and another 800,000 we anticipate this year in most likely FEMA related grants for uh, COVID related staffing or overtime costs. So that's, we are continuing to apply and, um, and tracking and the Sacramento County OES has, uh, has been very supportive of uh, us getting this money too. So um, yeah, it is an ongoing process, but it, the, the door is definitely not closed yet. Do you feel that that disbursement has been equitable amongst the different first responder groups? A little birdie in my ear told me that there were some federal disbursements from this area that appeared to not be equitable given the size of our institution and the call volume that we run. Uh, can you address that? Um, I'm, I, uh, I, I'm not that uh, looped in with the other agencies uh, to be able to compare, but okay. if someone else here could. I just one thing for consideration is, you know, a lot of the money that went to the county, we weren't eligible for as an independent sure. special district. A dependent special district would be but there was a separate legislative, um, you know, pass that was specific to supporting independent special districts. And, you know, it's, I mean, you've got quite a few agencies uh, competing for those available funds. But, um, you know, the largest, the largest amounts of those COVID cost recoveries went to cities and counties. And as an independent special district, we weren't eligible for uh, any county funding. And if I could dovetail yeah. uh, with Director White on this topic, uh, Jeff Fry uh, has mm -hmm. been doing a very, very diligent effort in um, rallying at the state level to release some of these monies to special districts, because uh, I would agree with the Director Gould. Um, I don't believe that we have gotten um, what we need in order to offset what we have spent. Uh, so I think to, uh, to Dave's point, the door has not closed yet. We're going to still continue uh, to look uh, down every avenue we can to help offset some of these expenses. I think the other thing I'd just add on is, you know, there seems to be um, some discretionary, you know, where those funds go. As you can see, there's some controversy in Sacramento County and where the, the majority of the percentage of those funds went because, you know, each agency is you know, seeking their, their share of those funds, but there is some uh, discretion um, in how they're dispersed or who they get dispersed to. I guess I would only say, I think that we need to continue to be at every one of those conversations, given the size of the impact that we had on, on the mitigation of that in this county, the thousands and thousands of patients that we treated 
by our first responders. And it seems to me like if you're going to start having those conversations, we've got a pretty good history of being right at the, at the front lines of all of that work. And so I would hope that we would be very aggressive in doing everything we can to, to seek reimbursement for what was really an unprecedented impact to our organization, both financially, as you can see the number on the screen, and just emotionally and physically and everything else in our organization. And I, I would hope that we don't get put second chair or third chair when, you know, I don't know of a call we didn't go on, even when we were told there was a likelihood that that patient had COVID. So thank you for the uh, clarification, but I hope we, and I know we will, we've got to be like a, you know, bull in a china cabinet to make sure that we get out of that conversation, I think a fair reimbursement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Gold. Are there any other questions or comments? I said one question. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, so, you know, I know it's not uncommon for GEMT to be delayed, but did um, Department of Healthcare Services or our consultant, is it Pelly Hall? Did they give- AP any, Triton. What's, okay, AP Triton, okay. Did either one of them give any um, projection or is that just too too difficult to determine uh, when we no I, it was um, it, 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 they did give a, a month I think it was September October I can't I can't remember which but there was a there was a date mentioned it was I said fall yeah. yeah and then I know sometimes they withhold a portion of it and give you 75 percent of it and give you the but um, so we're anticipating that shortfall coming in um, in September, October, you said? Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Mr. O'Toole? All right, seeing no more. Thank you, Mr. O'Toole for that presentation. Moving on. Uh, to, oh, we. That was an action item. Yes, yes. I will entertain a motion and a second. Madam Chair, I would move resolution A, memorandum, or excuse me, got ahead of myself there. Uh, resolution A, uh, the 2021 20, 22 mid year budget for the general operating fund, 212A. Second. Third. We have uh, Madam Clerk, we call the roll, please. Director Gould. Aye. Board Valley. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. I'll entertain. Madam Chair, I would move resolution B, All the 2021-22 right. 20, mid-year budget for the Capital Facilities Fund, 212B. Second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk. Director Gould. Aye. Borzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Madam Chair, I would move resolution C the 2021-22 mid-year budget for the grants fund, 212G. Second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk. Director Gould. Aye. Porzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank Madam you. Chair, I would move resolution D the 2021-22 mid-year budget for the development impact fees fund 212i. Second. We have a motion and a second, Madam Clerk. Dr. Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Taylor. Aye. Motion passes. Madam Chair. I would move resolution E, the 2021-22 mid-year budget for the leased properties fund, 212L. Second. We have a motion and a second, Madam Clerk. Director Gould. Aye. 
Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Madam Chair, I would move Resolution F, the 2021-22 mid-year budget for the Intergovernmental Transfer IGT Fund, 212M. Second. We have a motion and a second, Madam Clerk. Director Gould. Aye. Fourth Alley. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Moving on to reports. The president's report, I have none. Fire Chief's report, Acting Chief, Chief Wagaman. Go ahead and move so I can see everybody. Uh, good evening, uh, President Taylor's directors, Madam Clerk, staff, and the many members in the audience this evening. Um, tonight, I have before you the uh, Fire Chief's report. And I'm gonna start off by talking about the uh, position of engineer and for uh, our general population that are uh, zooming in tonight, our engineers are the folks that drive our apparatus, both our engines and our trucks throughout uh, Sacramento City and County. I bring this up today because it's one of the most rewarding jobs in the fire service, one that I hold dear to my heart and uh, something I absolutely loved when I was an engineer. Comes with a lot of responsibility, ensuring that our members get to and from calls safely is incredibly important. Um, and with that, I would like to speak to some promotions that we have as we just completed an engineer's promotional process. Uh, 16 people uh, went through that process uh, and were successful at uh, soon to be promoted uh, on the 7th of uh, March. And I'll go through them. Michael Duff, Joe Garza, Jeremy Grunman, Alexander Timchuk, Jordan Majestic, Cody Ardette, Chad Dillon, Matt Auer, Alexander Rodney, Eric Arso, Dave Leal, Casey Zanni, Sean McCarthy, Tyler Conical, Peter Sobrero, and Joshua Shelton. So congratulations to the 16 folks that made it through that process uh, and your soon to be promotion here in about a week or so. Uh, with all that being said, uh, I have to thank our labor group for having a seat at the table and having uh, really a strong influence on this testing process, as well as our training division and our human resources division uh, and the many men and women of Metro Fire that helped with our engineers academy. What we notice is when we have these academies prior to a promotional process, we have a lot more successes at the end of the testing process. And that's exactly what we experienced during this process as well. We have a reassignment. Uh, captain Russ Gardner uh, was selected to fill the training day captain position. And Captain Corey Keebler was reassigned from the training division back to his suppression uh, position on April 11th. The district would like to Thank Captain Keebler for his time and commitment with the training division. Next, I wanna to speak to member of the year. And it's that time of the year where our membership identify members of the district that have gone above and beyond and that have been identified as recipients for peer recognition. This year, uh, we have some folks that were selected as member of the year for 2021. And that's Captain Jason Cahill for uh, suppression recipient, network system engineer, Ken Lynn. That's for professional staff recipient, Captain Jason Butler, special operations recipient, assistant chief Barbie Law, EMS recipient. Additionally, for those that were not selected, but were nominated, retired annuitant, Terry Barnes, Firefighter Danielle Velasky, controller Ron Empatrod, firefighter Joe Kaufman, staffing specialist Lara Kelly, Captain Bryce Mitchell, engineer Dave Sutton. Additionally, the following individuals will receive a word of commendation, recommendation for commendation of valor, engineer Tyler Williamson, 
Captain or Company Commendations, Medic 109 B-Shift, Firefighter Kyle Barnum, Firefighter Austin Thiel, Engine 31 B-Shift, Captain Jason Winter, Engine 21 B-Shift, Captain J.D. Flint, Company Commendation for Medic 105 C-Shift, Firefighter Dylan Fader, and Firefighter Danny Kim. Peer Recognition, Captain Greg Lynch, Captain Nick Mack, Firefighter Cody Burdett, Reserve Firefighter Dennis Berry, Reserve Firefighter Rob Driver, and Reserve Firefighter Mark Siebert. So a big congratulations to each and every one of them. We are gonna have an awards gala this year. Uh, it will likely be held at the Arden Hills Country Club just to, as we have had in the past. And now that some of the COVID restrictions have been lifted, uh, we are shooting for mid-May. So that is just a tentative date. And as soon as we have it pinned down, we will certainly let you know because we would love to see each and every one of you there. That concludes the Fire Chief's report. I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Operations Chief Mitchell. Thanks, Chief Wagaman. Good evening, President Sailors Board. Happy to be here, everybody in the audience. I'm looking forward to getting back to some sense of normalcy and attending that awards gala. That's going to be some good stuff there. So um, a few items from operations uh, for you tonight. Since our last board report on February 24th, we ran a total of 3,908 incidents, which um, compared to the previous two, week is up, two weeks is up a little bit to about an average of 279 calls per day. By incident type, 65% of our responses were EMS related. And in that time frame, we responded to 151 fire incidents, which is up a little bit as well to 10.7 calls per day. Um, this past Tuesday, we continued our uh, biweekly or weekly, depending on the topics of discussion, meetings with hospital and healthcare system administrations, um, county health and human services, LEMSA, and our other regional fire agencies to discuss the current status and plans for the APOT issue that's been ongoing and some of those mitigations we're going to utilize moving forward past the end of March when the uh, FEMA grant funded paramedics were scheduled to be ending. However, that's, um, there's been some extensions within the LEMSA to extend into June, which is good news. We're working with the hospitals on not just the fact that this was a successful program on, on um, the impact on APOT, but also how is the hospital's um, administration going to utilize those positions moving forward into the, that next couple of months. So we're looking, we're looking forward to more of those meetings um, and getting some good headway there. Uh, for MIH, as of today, we're up now above 300 to 310 patient contacts since the pilot um, program inception. This week, um, our staff focused a lot on um, dealing with and working with multiple health, the multiple healthcare systems that are in our county and how they can utilize the program to a better extent to, to more robust to be able to integrate um, that additional um, avenue for patient care. Our Academy 22-1 is finishing up week two tomorrow out of 18. We're currently at 44 recruits. I visited with them today in the drill instructor cadre, some really good reports coming out of there. Um, I will say I... Um, Always enjoy seeing uh, Dr. Rossiter, who was there giving them um, a very high level lecture on cardiac um, items and things like that, that we can all appreciate. So it was good to see Doc today. Um, boat operations, uh, we have a, one, of our, one of two classes we're gonna be doing in the upcoming weeks going on right now. We got 12 new operators that are being trained, which is great news for us. Um, the second class, like I said, is coming in the coming weeks. Um, we're doing two this year. Uh, we plan for two right out of the gate just because the low water levels last year didn't allow us to do one of those classes. And so we wanted to um, further uh, infuse more operators into that. So we're ready for that summer season. Um, and they're going very well. I talked, I again, visited with them today as well. I went out to the river. Um, the students, instructors are all very happy with the level of instruction and our ability to be out there and train. Good news is it's the off season and it's cold. So we don't have a lot of users on the river right now, which really opens it up for us to do a lot of in-depth training. And then uh, finally tonight, our EMS uh, division is, is um, our folks out in the line are I'm going through a, a whole month of EMS training. Um, we're bringing in every company on all shifts. Um, we're focusing on um, training on the new mostly grant purchase LifePak 15 version four cardiac monitors that we'll be putting in service. Um, also on um, some of those lesser use skills, the childbirth skills. As well, we're talking about the new operative IQ narco narcotics tracking program that will be a little bit better. Um, you um, increase our ability to monitor what's going on with our narcotics and make sure we're meeting all those federal mandates and such like that. 
And then uh, finally, we also received as part of um, some extra grant money available, 12 of those Lucas CPR devices. We're looking to put those in service here coming up shortly. So unless there's any questions, that's the end of the operations report. Thank you, DC Mitchell. Does anyone have any questions or comments for him? Seeing none, thank you. Next is Firefighters Local 522, BC Mac Cole. Got a podium back. President Sailors, members of the board, everybody in attendance here and on Zoom. Um, I would first off like to thank many of you for your time since the last board meeting. Uh, breakfast, lunches, coffees. Um, so Director Sheets, Director Jones, Director Sailors, Director White, Director Clark, um, and we also, many of us spoke on the phone. Um, I'd like to especially thank Director Gould and the crews at Station 24. Uh, Director Gould just figured, finished up his 48-hour ride-along with the crews at Station 24. Uh, I called to mandatory him this morning, but he was out on a call and did not call me back. So we'll <laughs> talk about that after this meeting. But um, that level of support for the membership and what we do out there um, is very much appreciated and resonated through uh, the entire membership. So thank you very much, Director Gould, for that support. Uh, I would like to welcome the seven new members into the SRP program. We have seven new union members, two ALS providers and uh, five BLS providers. So I was fortunate to get out and meet them at Station 50. So welcome to all of them. Wish them success. Um, and congratulations to the 16 new engineers, some in attendance here, that were promoted on, on Monday the 7th, just a few days ago. So that was great to have them promoted and help with staffing immediately. So for everybody who helped move that test up in HR and the training division and, and in the labor group, Thank you very much. And I'm excited to see um, that greatly impact positively our staffing and some of the challenges we had coming out of, out of COVID. Um, I would like to express very uh, sincere appreciation to the board for moving through our contract extension on consent. I am appreciative of the additional benefit that that provides to the membership and their families. I'm appreciative that we continue to stay under contract for the year 2022 but mostly I'm appreciative because those two things uh, allow us to really have an opportunity to look at how we do business and provide service and protection to our community. Um, I think the saying is that it's always darkest before the dawn and COVID was challenging on so many fronts for us personally and professionally. And so now as an organization, um, this isn't made on wood, but knock on plastic, it feels as if we may be transitioning out of some of those dark days and I think what we have in front of us is a real opportunity to look at how we do business. We're going to continue to negotiate a long-term deal. I'm fully committed to that. Um, and I'm confident we will come up with something together. You know, today I was forwarded uh, a recruitment from AMR that represents double the pay of what we give SRPs and a recruitment from Vacaville Fire that the laterals are able to specifically negotiate their compensation package. Those are challenging things to figure out how we match here. But as we do that, I think the most important lift is to ensure that this is a place where people also want to be and feel very valued and supported and empowered. And so momentum is building behind that. Being under contract, that, uh, that lift starts next week. On the 15th, there will be a kickoff for a working group. Uh, it's a collaboration of labor and management led by Chief Rudnicki on the management side and, and Mike Gildone on the labor side. And, um, we intend to look at everything we do and how we do it to ensure that we are successful and strong moving into the future. And we intend on building so much momentum behind that, that no small group of naysayers, uh, no seemingly huge hurdle or intimidation by change can stop that from happening because that's what we need as an organization to ensure that our community is protected at the highest level way beyond my years here. So um, again, the appreciation that I have for this contract extension is because of all of the opportunity that we have in front of us. And it's gonna take all of us fully committed to that, to push that through. So for what you've already done to give us that opportunity and for my uh, asking up front for the willingness to roll up your sleeves and, and help us drive that change, I would like to thank all of you one more time. And that's the end of my report, unless you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions for our 522 vice president. 
Cheers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, it did, it did spark one question actually to direct to uh, Director Gould is um, from, you know, the ARC program. I know we have ARC, Sac State, um, you know, the uh, NCTI program. The, the workforce development, are you seeing any increase in uh, class sizes or success rates for, at ARC? Well, that's a two-part question. Success rates have, are, are fairly stable. They don't fluctuate much. Some young person that commits to the level that it requires to become an advanced life support provider, uh, that's a very high level of success across the different uh, organizations. The second question is, is significantly different, and that's about trends in the industry relative to workforce, and it is not good. If I could describe it in few words, it is terrifying what's happening in the workforce and public safety across the country. So uh, as uh, Matt just described, it's pull up your sleeves and we have got to be beyond creative uh, in ways we've never even considered. Uh, many of the traditions that are in this industry may have to be tweaked in order for us to survive. People do not Young people do not want to come into public safety in the in the levels that they have historically. So we've we've got a real opportunity as an organization to do some very creative things, some of which will include institutions of higher learning. So from a workforce development perspective, having more schools probably isn't the, the answer. Not, it is not it is not the answer. If you use a chest pain analogy, scale one to 10, 10 being the worst we've ever seen, it's a 14. Thanks for the uh, not so. The, well, you, you, you kind of set me up. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was hoping for a little more op optimistic report. Well, then I'd be lying. Yeah, thanks. All right, now. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know where I was. Number four, committee and delegate reports. Yes, committee and delegate reports. Because um, we have the union. So, um, executive committee, I have nothing to report. Next up is Communication Center JPA, Deputy Chief Flagerman. Thank you once again, uh, VP Cole. Um, yeah, you're correct. Uh, March 7th was a week ago, not a week from now. Welcome to my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, Comm Center JPA uh, last met on Tuesday, March 8th, here at the Metro Fire Board Chambers. Uh, during that board meeting, we had three action items, all of which were approved unanimously. Uh, item number one was the 10th contract amendment with Paracon, which is our CAD vendor. Uh, basically what that did is it took three of our maintenance agreements and combined them into one uh, to allow for one single payment. The second item was the approval for direct technologies to upgrade our dispatch monitors. Uh, something that has been needed for quite some time there. As you can imagine, imagine those dispatch monitors, they, they never get a break. Uh, they're on 24-7, 365. Lastly was a PAD adjustment and the addition of a new job description for administrative manager. With the addition of the administrative manager, uh, we are removing uh, the deputy director of administration. This will be now uh, a direct alignment with the operations manager at the dispatch center. We will meet again on March 12th here, Metro Fire Board Chambers, nine o'clock. Uh, that ends my report, unless you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions for? All right, moving on, California Fire and Rescue Training, JPA. No report. Thank you, no report. <laughs> uh, Finance and Audit Committee, Director Orzali. Uh, the Finance and Audit Committee uh, did not meet and uh, our next meeting is to be determined. Thank you very much. Policy Committee, Director Gould. No report. Thank you. All right, 
We shall have board member questions and comments. Um, Director Jones, if you have any comments tonight. Thank you very much, Madam President. I do not, uh, uh, congratulations, congratulations to all the award recipients, the peer review recognition award. I apologize, I don't have a list in front of me, but uh, the, the names have been recorded into the record. Way to go, congratulations. Again, this is a peer recognition situation, which means a whole lot to me and I'm sure everybody in this room. Congratulations to the engineers. Yay, that is terrific. That is absolutely terrific. And I wanted to thank their multiple members of staff who have assisted me with uh, information and uh, community uh, questions, citizen concerns, and just a blanket thank you to pretty much all the senior staff. Madam President. Thank you. Um, Director Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too wanted to uh, offer my congratulations to the individuals that have been promoted to engineer. Nice to see so many people out in the audience this evening and uh, congratulations to y'all. Thank you, Director Kelly. Uh, Director Sheets, do you have any comments tonight? I do, I wanted to congratulate all of the engineers, the ones that are here in the audience um, and those who could be here today. That's uh, very exciting. Um, congratulations also to all the award recipients. I look forward to celebrating them at the uh, awards. Um, I want to thank uh, Station 32 for their hospitality um, and uh, the great dialogue. Also, Vice President um, Mr. Cole uh, for uh, great dialogue, and I look forward to the partnership. That's it. Thank you, Director Sheets. Director Wood. The risk of uh, being redundant. Uh, congratulations to all the engineers. Uh, appreciate everyone who does come down and log on to the meetings and, and get involved in what we do. And also to all those who were recognized by the peers for their work. Congratulations to all of you and look forward to the dinner. So thank you. Thank you, Director Wood. Director Rosali. Uh, I have no report for this evening. Thank you, Director Rosali. Director Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few minutes ago, you heard me be a rain cloud. I apologize for that. That was not intentional, however, truthful. Um, I also want to make mention that in those times when we are faced with what appears to be insurmountable um, challenges, this organization has a long history of being able to come together and overcome those challenges. And I expect the exact same thing to occur when it comes to workforce development for this organization. We will take the lead nationally uh, as we go through this process. So I, I didn't get an opportunity to say that when uh, Director White asked me that question. So I have full faith and confidence of the skill sets of the individuals that are sitting on this uh, Zoom meeting and in this, this event tonight, that they are bright enough that we will be able to come up with with solutions. Secondly, as was mentioned, um, I wanna thank all of the crew members that I had an opportunity to interact with over the last 48 hours, their hospitality, their professionalism, of course, their day-to-day -day work was impeccable. It was very enlightening on the impact that our system uh, has from outside parties of which we have no control. Um, and I look forward to working diligently and figuring out solutions for, uh, those exact issues. But again, thank you very much for tolerating my presence uh, and stumbling over me when I didn't know which door to get into on occasion because it was too dang early in the morning. Uh, but thank you very much and look forward to doing that again uh, shortly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Gould. Uh, Director White. Uh, thank you. Uh, President Sailors. Uh, I also want to you know, congratulate all of the engineers uh, there's a lot that goes into being an engineer and haven't been one. I know that it's probably the most thoroughly evaluated position. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to know how to pump. You need to know how to drive. You need to know how to do a very detailed preventative maintenance inspection on our equipment. So I really appreciate those that put in the time, energy, and effort and prepare to be successful because they would not be on that list if they didn't demonstrate the, the ability to uh, perform that role well. Uh, also wanna commend all of the uh, recipients, board recipients this year. Um, as far as Director Gould, I wouldn't refer to you as much a rain cloud as maybe just an alarmist. 
but uh, I do appreciate your honesty and candor and want to commend you on taking the time to, uh, to go pull a 48 hour shift and really look at this district's operations from the field level. So it, it is uh, pretty commendable of you to do that. Uh, so just wanted to say thanks. Thank you, Director White. Director Clark. Yes. Um, <laughs> congratulations to the engineers and all the guys, the men and women that are uh, receiving awards. I'm looking forward to the uh, to the ceremony. And that's all I have to add. Everything else has been said. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Clark. I too would like to extend my congratulations to the newly promoted engineers. That um, is the most coveted and most enjoyed position on any fire department. Having driven an engine downtown for close to 13 years, as uh, Chief White said, it is the best job on the department. Um, having said that, I would like to extend my congratulations to the members of the year that were picked by their peers. That doesn't get any better than that. It's like the M MVP award on any sports team. That's great. Um, I just wanna to say to everyone out there and that's working, stay safe, um, continue to be the best that you are um, for everyone. And I'm gonna say that we are going to close session now and I don't want to see anybody out here when we come back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. All right. All right. Do we need to do the roll call thing again? Nope. No, turn it open. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we back? On We're back on. All right. We're on back on. Go ahead and uh, report out. Right. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Uh, the board met in closed session with the uh, items set forth in the closed session agenda. Item number one. Conference with legal counsel, Hayes Engineering Construction versus Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District, as the board voted to approve that settlement. Uh, items number two, uh, 2A, the government uh, tort claim uh, for money damages filed by Danielle Hanna uh, et al. versus Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. The board uh, voted to uh, deny that claim. 2B, the claim of Sergi Alter versus Sacramento Metropolitan, Metropolitan uh, Fire District for money damages, the board voted unanimously to deny that claim. Uh, 2C, uh, the claim against the Metro Fire for money damages on behalf of Natalia Alter versus Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District, the board voted to unanimously to deny that claim. And finally, on the uh, government, court, uh, uh, government code section 910, claim for damages by Deborah uh, Gentiluomo uh, versus Metropolitan Sac Metro Fire, uh, the board voted unanimously to deny that claim. On item number three, the public employee performance evaluation for the fire chief, uh, no reportable action was taken. On item number four, public employee performance evaluation for the board clerk, no reportable action was taken. And that's it. Thank you, Council Lava. I do declare this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Have a good, good weekend. <laughs>